I've never listened to the All In podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, he- I hear enough from VCs opining on topics they don't know about already, so I don't need any more of that. <laughs> That's the cold open. Yeah, amazing. Before we dive into Moment of Zen, I want to tell you about my new interview show, Upstream. Upstream is where I go deeper with some of the world's most interesting thinkers to map the constellation of ideas that matter. On the first season of Upstream, you'll hear from Mark Andreessen, David Sachs, Balaji, Ezra Klein, Joe Lonsdale, and more. Make sure to subscribe and check out the first episode with Mark Andreessen. The link is in the description. What's going on? Uh, All good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Sounds like Jason listened to uh, our podcast episode. Did, did he mention it? Well, he said he listened to the Balaji podcast, which I would imagine he listened to ours. Or if he didn't, if he didn't, then he didn't really get much from, from some of the other ones. But if he listened to ours, at least there was a, an intellectual discussion. Yeah, it's funny. He, he said like Balaji's been on a tour or something, but Balaji's only went on three podcasts. He, he said Balaji went on like 20 of them or something. He, he went on ours, he went on Bankless, and he went on Pomp. I think he, I think he was salty that... Uh, he didn't go to he, did, he didn't go to all in right <laughs> yeah. so they had to talk about the bet but they didn't actually have Balaji. <laughs> although yeah. i don't think that that group would want Balaji on there because they had him one time and they just couldn't deal with the fact that like <laughs> they weren't gonna be able to get a word in edgewise yeah <laughs> I, I enjoyed your exchange with Balaji or in our group chat I, I feel like that was a good exchange yeah i mean i think where i am at the point is like i have my set of beliefs <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna back down <laughs> i have like a intellectual framework to back them up Present me with evidence that will change that. Otherwise, we can agree to disagree. And in 90 days, we will see in a falsifiable way who is right and who's wrong. Did you get any feedback from the, the pod that we did? No, nothing specific. I mean, I, I actually get just a lot of DMs from people trying to get on Farcaster who are like, oh, I love the pod. And I think generally people, people seem positive on it that we push back enough in the sense that we, we, we it wasn't kind of like a let biology talk for the whole hour it was it was a discussion i think i think that the the most challenging thing is we actually agree on a lot it's just it, and we get into these circles where it's like we're, we're kind of like ranting about whatever and it's like no no, no. like I, I agree with you on the you know the htm stuff like seems seems like that was a uh an oversight from the regulatory framework but like when we actually try to get to brass tacks on the things that we disagree about, I don't know. I don't feel like the, the conversation really <laughs> happens. It, it, we kind of divert again into to people talking past each other. So. And it, so if, if you believe the framework here is he needs to get the word out and he needs to convince the moderate person, the reasonable person that this is actually an issue. By having all in cover it without him there, that's, that's actually how most people are going to be exposed to it. They're not going to have listened to MLC. They're not going to have listened to the other podcasts that he went on. And I, I think like there's like an appeal that like, okay, you have these long tweets now that you have unlimited characters um, with citations, but the average person is not actually consuming information like that. Like the, the people you are convincing with that are they're already the people who are buying Bitcoin. Like it's it's like there's a high correlation with like they want a deep Twitter thread to convince them. Let me ask you, yeah. does the moderate person influence Bitcoin? Like is it mostly institution the price of Bitcoin? Is it mostly institutions? No, it's 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 entirely retail driven. It's retail. Still, still 10 years later wow. it's retail. It's it's a it's a retail market. It's it's not that deep from a liquidity pool. Right? So his his argument was like, oh well if they cut the the, the exits, then the price is gonna moon. It's like, uh, actually, that would then still require more people to want to be getting into something that they now have know that it has less liquidity. Yeah. I also think that the the fundamental premise is like, I give him credit. He's willing to to kind of like, you know, he practices what he preaches in the sense that like willingness to to move from location X to location Y, right? But I don't think that that's the right model. That's like the normal person is not going to do that. And, and so if, if you start from, you need to get to a Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction as like the ultimate thing, it's like, well, that's not happening. And then you just kind of work your way up. It's like, most people are just not going to do anything. I don't own any Bitcoin right now. I sold it a few months ago. Um, I was, um, I'm waiting like, and I'm not buying in because I assume that like I'm, I'm sensitive to regulation scares. Like if, if, 
if it gets harder to buy Bitcoin, people aren't going to buy. I'm not going to buy Bitcoin. I don't even know how to buy Bitcoin that's not on an exchange. <laughs> and I'm like a technical person. Like a, I'm in tech. Like, Right. And, and here's the thing. Who's the market with? Other people <laughs> who are like paranoid about the government. Like he, he, the, the, the leap of logic here is that somehow there is going to be a set of governments that are going to just abandon the the US dollar hegemony reserve. Hey, what's going on, Nick? Hey guys. And so that like jump, he he never explains mechanically how it happens, right? Yep. And it's like it's like, well, you know, get get to UAE or whatever. It's like, dude, the UAE exists under the American security blanket. Like they don't they don't exist. Saudi Arabia wakes up one day or Iran wakes up one day and they're just like hungry for a snack and they just go and go and grab it. Like that, that that's not a real country. Like the only real countries are like China. And it's just like, do, do many people move to China who are not Chinese? And in China, you just get disappeared if they don't like you, right? Like you make the wrong prediction there, you get thrown off a building. Look, I love biology, but he's an America doomer. And <laughs> you just can't be a doomer. It's morally wrong to be a doomer. <laughs> Even if things are terrible and you're correct, you should still have an optimistic attitude, I think. You know, it's like if you're stranded in the wilderness somewhere, you can't just like be a doomer about it because <laughs> it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. D to Balaji's credit, he is trying to actually offer an alternative ideology with the network state. And like, this is how you can actually replace it. I just think it's a, a step too far for even even like kind of like a tech savvy moderate, whatever you want to say. It's like, no, no one's going to buy into that. So you, you're only going to find, I think, extremists into that. No, you're right. He does offer an, an, an alternative. I'm waiting to see someone actually create a network state, though. How's it going? Hey, Nick. Good to see you to meet face to face. I think it's the first time we've ever. I feel like I see you tweeting about Miami a lot. Are you in Miami? I, I'm glad. I'm glad you had that impression. That's actually um, using my old genetic Miami Cuban CIA tactics to give you the impression that I'm Miami. When in fact, uh, I'm unfortunately in the petri dish known as San Francisco. But the bookshelf is a giveaway because none of the apartments serve bookshelves <laughs> in them, at least the, the furnished ones. Right, because no, nobody reads here. One of the necessary delusions of tech is being completely amnesiac. Oh, and I think historical. he was making a comment that so, there are yeah. no books in Miami. Miami. Uh, well, that isn't me being <laughs> anti-Miami. It's just an observation. All of the furnished apartments I've rented here did not have bookshelves, and I was scandalized by that. By the way, I think Dan has, has regressed into Soho art gallery owner mode. It's interesting. You assume a different persona every single, every single show. Antonio body shames me at the beginning of every podcast. No, no, I, I, I fashion pump you. I don't body shame you. But by the way, our comment section has been calling Dan uh, Romero Jim Halpert uh, from The Office. <laughs> I see it. That's the Jim face right there. I, I always thought he was face from the A team, but in any case, it was like the good-looking guy in a, in a pack of scoundrels. Well, we are lucky to have uh, here today Nick Carter, who All In has uh, just referred to lovingly as kid and uh, a bit crazy. I thought that was both <laughs> true allegations. <laughs> Did they accuse you of pumping your bags, basically? <laughs> I, that's life in 2023. Yeah. So, Nick, we need, we, need, we need some beef. How are you going to respond? I've never listened to the All In podcast. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i hear i hear enough from vcs opining on topics they don't know about already so i don't need any more of that <laughs> that's the cold open yeah amazing um dan why don't you introduce uh why now is a perfect time to have, have nick on the podcast yeah so no nick really long time um been in crypto for 10 plus years each i think and uh i think nick has done an amazing job recently highlighting a major issue in the US specifically for crypto and how fragile and, and kind of brittle of a state that we are in for fiat rails. Um, and, and the reason I'm sensitive to this is I actually did this at Coinbase, like a lot of those bank relationships and, and some of these banks that have now blown up, I, I was the one that was actually managing the Coinbase strategic partnership, right? Like you can't just go walk in off the, the street to a bank branch as a, as a crypto company and be like, hi, I'd like a bank account, please. Like in order to actually do what a company like Coinbase does, where you take fiat and you can swap it into crypto and out, you need effectively a, like a merchant bank account, like a, a, a wholesale bank account. And that requires an onboarding process. You, the company, actually need to do almost like a reverse sale to get in, in there. 
And I think Nick has been the only one really highlighting the fact that we are going through a kind of period here where it's important is like, there's no new law. It's just uh, kind of like subtle pressure behind the scenes, a, a new agenda set of politics that's putting pressure on on the very few number of banks that actually are willing to work with crypto companies. And so given all the recent stuff, you know, episode of Biology last week, uh, the SVB collapse, but more importantly, Signature and Silvergate also disappearing. Um, it's probably worth having Nick walk us through what Operation Choke Point is. Yeah, well, uh, that's a great summary. And uh, I actually have a bunch of questions for you about uh, Coinbase's experience with SVB, because there's a lot of mythology around that. I don't know how much of it is true or not, but uh, people like to say that bank relationship is what allowed Coinbase to survive and continue to be an exchange in the early days, and whereas Circle went a different direction because they couldn't retain banking relationships. I think this was 2014, 15 era. Yes. Is that actually true? Is that sort of, uh, you know, the critical turning point nexus? Well, let me, let me flip the, the story there. It's actually Coinbase and SPB broke up. So the, the, the story was when I think Brian started Coinbase, it was 2012, like magic internet money is like World of Warcraft gold, who cares? And so he was able to get an SPB account because of, of YC. And so was using the account and then they wanted to add payments and they went in and they met with someone and they were like, oh, sure, I guess we, we can let you do ACH payments, sure. So that happened in kind of 2013, you have this major Bitcoin run up and you also have the Silk Road situation. I actually think there are two major run ups. It's like the one in March and then there's like one in November. And SVB was just like, whoa, like we didn't sign up for, for this thing where it's like now you're moving, you know, something where it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to millions and tens of millions of dollars a day. And, and an important thing to know is like with banks, ACH is reversible and it's actually effectively reversible forever. Like I found this out at Coinbase uh, when we had some fraud issues. But basically that means if you have a startup who's debiting a whole bunch of accounts in, in dollars and swapping those into a, a irreversible cryptocurrency that you can send onto a blockchain, uh, should 30 days later, a whole bunch of that be fraud, there is no way for the company like Coinbase to claw back that money. And so that actually is an incredibly insane issue you have to manage. Like it's just like ACH fraud. And, and it's just yet another thing that banks don't want to necessarily work with you. So fast forward to 2015, basically SVB was like, we're done with the crypto business. And so we, we want to be out. And so that's actually where I, I come into the story is like, I ended up establishing a bunch of other relationships, Cross River Bank, Silvergate, Metropolitan Bank. And what we found out was, is that SVB lied to us because they kept the bank account open with Circle. And so Circle has had an SVB account, and that's why they had USDC there as of just even, you know, two weeks ago, is SVB and Circle have always had a, had a privileged relationship. Jeremy is, you know, a pretty polished CEO compared to at least where Brian and, and Fred were at the time. And I think like knew how to kind of manage the the internal workings of the compliance departments at, at a, lo a large bank. So what, what's interesting is S SVB actually kind of kicked Coinbase to the, the curb. And had we not gotten those bank relationships in place, one of which CRB, I think Coinbase still uses today, basically all of the fiat rails in the US would have shut off in 2015. Like there may not have had like any simple easy payments when we've been back to like the Mt. Gox era where you had to like send some like weird Dwala payment to like a third party intermediary and then have it get to like Japan. And so, so like this has been a super tenuous thing in the past. And then for the last five years, crypto banking has kind of been like, oh, like we've solved it. Signature showed up, like they, they have this thing Signet and all that. But um, we're, we're as close to where we were in, in 2015 as, as I, the last 10 years. Like, so this is as brittle wow. of a situation as possible. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Moment of Zen is brought to you by Riverside, the platform Dan, Antonio, and I use to record all of our podcast episodes with remote guests. Riverside captures exceptional audio and video quality, makes it incredibly easy for us to record conversations with multiple guests and then edit and publish within minutes. If you're hosting a podcast or often getting interviewed, use our code ZEN to get a 20% discount at Riverside FM. The link is in our description box.
SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months, and it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it, and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame. That's, that's my view as well, is that we're basically going back to the bad old days where getting a merchant account at a bank is immensely difficult, especially for a startup or a smaller firm, especially for someone without sort of top tier VC backers. And whether you can get those relationships is make or break for your business. Whereas as far at least in my opinion, I don't think banking should be the thing that determines whether you succeed as a business. It should be something that every startup has the right to. But that's sort of where we're going now. We had this kind of magical era of boutique crypto focused banks from kind of 2017 to 22. They've been vaporized. And now there's a handful of banks that still service crypto, but they're pretty, they have a lot of pressure to not do it. So we're, we're rewinding, we're going back uh, to the bad old days, as far as I can tell. Dan, do you want to pump Cross River for a second? Because I find them to be fascinating as a cultural phenomenon. Cross River Bank is one of the few banks that I think still works with crypto companies to get today. Although I don't think it's like a like walk in off the street and like you can get an account like what Silvergate and Signature were doing. Cross River is a, a fintech oriented bank in northern New Jersey. Um, I think that a lot of the folks there are uh, Orthodox uh, Jewish, so they uh, kind of like have a tribe, and um, they are like one of the most reliable partners I've ever worked with in any situation in, in my entire professional career. And so it's like thick and thin. Um, but, but it's like, you can actually go to their website. Uh, I actually think Curtis, uh, his most recent post, he, he actually cited it. But Antonio, what's it called? The, the like Jewish thing that you have to, the, the history era. Is, is that why you're getting a circumcision in order to get that banking relationship? <laughs> Jesus I, Christ. Does Nick know, does Nick know <laughs> that Antonio is converting to Judaism? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> is, that real? is that true? Yeah. Got to do what you got to do. <laughs> One of our fans published a bingo card. And so there's like a random reference that doesn't quite make any sense. It's because he's going to knock off. And one of the things is Antonio's pending circumcision. We're, we're 30 days away, right? Uh, yeah, um, just, just about. I'm doing it. Believe it or not, I'm doing it at Consensus in Austin. Like on so, stage? As, or? as an odd confluence. <laughs> not, not on. Hey, let me moderate. The sign, the sign let me moderate. The, covenant, the, the, the <laughs> circumcision and, and buying some Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that came out the wrong way, but, um, uh, but, uh, it, yeah, sort of, I didn't know you actually had to do that to convert as an adult. Jesus Christ. All right. So all right. a brief aside on Jewish law, you can't get circumcised twice as it turns out. Um, and so there's a symbolic circumcision that involves drawing of blood. Dude, you already circumcised this whole time. You wouldn't have anything left if you got a second one. God damn it, we already knocked <laughs> off. We already knocked off the thing on the card. Okay. You don't have to go into it anymore. <laughs> To finish the comment, there's a loophole because the Torah actually forbids uh, interest, charging interest. And so there's some sort of halakhic loophole around the whole thing. And that's actually published on the website. I'm surprised yeah, Curtis, cited Curtis, it in this Curtis post. basically made the point, I think, after having read Nick's article, um, is like that the system is is pretty brittle right now. And his point is that if like the government wants to shut off crypto, it's it's about like this much work in, in the scheme of things because we don't actually have any regulatory protection. There is no law from Congress that's like guaranteeing a certain set of rights. Uh, we haven't had a Supreme Court case yet, so it's not like something's getting lumped in under the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, depending on how you want to try to deem crypto, right? It's like encryption is it is it right to bear arms? Um, but but yeah, like I think like we we are at the mercy, for the most part, of unelected bureaucrats who are in some version of the OCC. Uh, you know, CFTC, the SEC, but also the Fed and the FDIC and Treasury. And it's like that group of people gets to decide, plus New York Department of Financial Services, anytime someone does anything in New York, that group of people gets to decide crypto policy in the US until we have congressional legislation. And if you think about the banks, their incentive is like, okay, so I have this crypto customer. I don't make that much money from them. Their, their deposits are actually kind of like flighty, right? Like they have these huge booms during an up market and then they come way down. So it actually kind of makes my like capital ratio, I, I'm not a banking expert, but like it's just more, more challenging. 
it significantly increases the amount of work every time the regulator comes in, however often, three months, six months, a year. I have to do all this additional work to prove that I'm not uh, you know, doing all these scary things that people uh, just generally lump in with crypto, right? Even, even though that's all happening with dollars. I mean, we had a Hindenburg research report this week uh, outlining all the stuff that happens on Cash App, not in their Bitcoin business, but in the, the P2P business. Whether or not that's true, doesn't matter. But the, the whole point is like, if you have a payment system, people will use it for criminal and fraudulent purposes, no matter how much regulatory stuff that you put in, like money laundering will always exist. And so anyways, but going back to the idea that like the banks, they just have this, it's, it's, a, it's a reputation risk. And, and then the regulator is just like, you can kind of view the regulator as kind of lazy. They're like, I don't want to do any additional work. So all they say is like, this seemed really sc uh, scary and risky. Why would you bank a crypto company? And so it's actually a lot of additional work for the, the bank to actually keep doing it. And so that's why you have to find these kind of like partners that are actually just like, they're, they're completely solid. And, and they're not strictly doing it uh, for the, the X dollars. It's, it's they actually believe in, in the ability to like offer uh, a legitimate crypto client the access to the banking accounts. Yeah, that's precisely correct. And uh, the disappointing thing is that there were really just two institutions that were explicitly pro crypto in the US. And in the space of a week, they're gone. And everyone else, there are other banks that service crypto clients. There's like a dozen in the US. But no, neither of them is like avowedly openly pro crypto. They're kind of doing it in the shadows. They don't actually really want to be associated with crypto. They would like to do it quietly. Um, and now they now there's an informal rule at the FDIC where their deposits are capped. The crypto associated deposits are capped. So we cannot really go back to this age where you had these boutiques that were pro-crypto, happy to onboard basically anyone uh, because those two firms uh, don't exist anymore. Whether that's insidious or they made bad decisions, either way, they're out of the market. So we're left in a, a tricky situation here. I think the other thing um, worth calling out is there have been some efforts, uh, I think especially in Wyoming, where... There have been a number of, of companies that have actually wanted to go start a new type of bank, specifically something called like a narrow bank. Uh, is I think Lynn Alden maybe has that term, or but but the idea is that there's no fractional reserve, so it's 100 percent like any dollar that goes in just sits in a bank account, and the the whole reason that these institutions would exist is to get access, direct access to the the payment rails of the United States, which right now are ACH and, and Fed Wire. Fed now is coming later this year. Um, some people think that's the CBDC. It's, it's actually not. It's actually Fed now is the Fed's version of ACH. ACH is actually a consortium of 20 large banks in the United States. So Fed now is actually helping smaller banks. But um, basically, those payment systems, the only way you can actually have like direct metal access like to the, the, the core system is you have to be a bank. And you as a fintech, every single fintech app you use, Robinhood, Square, Chime, whatever, they all are a kind of app level veneer on an actual bank that has a banking charter and direct access to those rails. And so the, the fact that those new banks have not been approved, actually one interesting thing about Cross River is Cross River is one of the last banks in the United States after or, and around the financial crisis to get a new charter. They, I think they had been in the hopper, so they got it. But basically, the other thing to look at is like since since like 2010, there have basically been no new banks created in the United States. Whereas for a very long time, like, you know, because you can either be a federally regulated bank or a, a state level bank, uh, you could, if you wanted to go create a bank, you could raise enough capital, equity capital, and then you could actually go and start it. So it was actually somewhat of a dynamic environment. But post financial crisis, the amount of regulatory capture largely driven by, like, I think a lot of like what Liz Elizabeth Warren has like put in place with both the CFPB and just like the Dodd-Frank stuff. And, and, and then obviously she's, she's the primary kind of instigator on all, all of this like anti-crypto banking stuff. But basically there is no dynamism in the US banking system anymore. It's, it's actually, it's like, you, you, it's like a limited supply of these licenses and the banks kind of have all gotten a lot bigger uh, as a result or, or, you know, consolidation because the, you don't have any new entrants. No one can come in and offer like an actual new service that's like, hey, I don't I actually I'm not going to do fractional reserve and I want to just give you direct access to the, the payment rates. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Since the 90s, I think if you look at it, 
the number of banks has contracted in the US by something remarkable, like 75%. Um, and you, you're absolutely right, Dan. There's virtually no new de novo charters since the financial crisis. Two reasons, I would say. One, interest rates were low, so it just wasn't really profitable to start a new bank. And then the other reason is Dodd-Frank created a huge number of new compliance overhead issues that just made it much more expensive to be, in particular, a small bank. And uh, now, of course, the other issue is nobody trusts smaller banks because they are unsure as to whether those unsecured deposits would be safe in a crisis. Um, and, of course, the Fed is disallowing these new charters. Custodia got denied in pretty stunning fashion. I would say really unusual in terms of the aggressiveness of the denial. Kraken had one outstanding in Wyoming as well. So this will actually be looked at as a state's rights issue, I think, with the states are trying to allow the creation of new bank models and the federal government just straight up disallowing it. And then at the national level, the OCC created a charter, uh, like the FinTech charter. And um, I don't know if that was the one specifically under which the the three crypto-focused institutions applied, but you had Anchorage, and they got theirs. And then Pratigo and Paxos were in limbo for over a year. I think Pratigo's has just been withdrawn. So you can't even use that path. So... Basically, it's not like at all free market. I mean, it's always been understood that banks are kind of like public-private partnerships. So you exist kind of at the behest of the state. But now the consolidation that's going to happen is going to further compress the set of entities in the banking system, which is going to obviously reduce competitiveness. It's going to increase intermediation. So the level of extractiveness will increase and if you wanted to create a new boutique which serves a niche market like crypto, you can't do that. So that's that's another reason why this is so bad. Because there are entrepreneurs that are willing to go through all those hurdles and get those charters to serve crypto, and they just can't. Do you think it's irredeemable? Like, what, what, uh, what if anything, could change? I mean, I, I think the administration has significantly overstepped here and probably gone outside the rule of law in a few instances and just as with choke point 1.0 there's ways to react to that so really there's two ways so congress uh could issue subpoenas and find out what the decision making was like at uh, in particular the fdic occ fed um especially with regards to these recent bank closures in particular silver uh signature which i think is incredibly suspicious and so they can determine whether those regulators stepped outside the bounds of their authority, which I think they absolutely did. I don't think it's legal in this country to impose like a soft ban on banks servicing a specific industry. This was already sort of covered and litigated with choke point 1.0. And then secondly, in the courts as well, I think, um, for instance, signature uh, shareholders or entities that were deplatformed by signature and suffered some harm due to that. They can also challenge DFS's decision to put them into receivership. So I think it's basically a constitutional issue. Like how much power are we giving federal regulators? Do they have the ability to redline an industry by explicitly or implicitly offering guidance to the banks that they regulate? Um, and I think ultimately the Supreme Court, where I think this is where this will go, I think the Supreme Court will find that they don't have that right. Uh, but that, of course, those the wheels of justice take a very long time to grind. So it might just be a matter of being up against it for the next two years. And, and what's the incentive here for, for these regulators? Is it to have a convenient scapegoat? Um, is it to is someone getting rich off this? Is it just a bureaucratic, you know, emergent thing? Like, why is this happening? Honestly, I think most of them are fairly sincere uh, in their uh, in their motives. They simply believe that crypto introduces systemic risks into the banking sector and uh, basically destabilizes the sort of like TradFi legacy banking sector. They can now use these examples of Silvergate, SVB to a lesser extent, and Signature to advance that claim. 
because those were the first three major banks to fail. And of course, now we have like a massive global financial crisis with Credit Suisse and maybe Deutsche Bank and others. I mean, of course, the ultimate cause is not crypto. Crypto is far too small to destabilize the system. And if I were to identify a cause, I would say it's simply interest rates whipsawing from 0% to you know 500 basis points in, in a, a year, which would destabilize any, um, any banking system. Of course, like the business model of banks is to take on that duration risk. And so it's not a surprise now that we have this crisis. So, yeah, no, but I really do think, um, for the most part, the regulators actually think they're doing a good thing by ring fencing crypto. But, I, yeah, I just don't think that it's legal, strictly speaking. The, the other thing I think that gets conflated is, so Silvergate was a voluntary wind-up. So there was no Fed intervention, no backstop, no nothing. It was, they basically had their equity holders got got hit, right? And so then the bank just gave back the deposits. So all the deposits were there, right? So there was no, oh, HTM like thing over here. We need the Fed to like swap out the the bonds and, and pay us now because it was a liquidity issue. It was just, okay, voluntary uh, wind down. Now, maybe there was some pressure there or they were going to be having other issues, but that, that didn't cost taxpayers anything, right? The only people who lost is equity. Uh, SVB, obviously, equity wiped out. You argue that taxpayers aren't going to have to pay for it if if the FDIC covers it. And SVB at this point really wasn't a crypto bank. They had one relationship, the circle. But then the the one that no one is actually talking about that got, got it like it was like um what what's the Nixon massacre Saturday night max like uh you know what I'm talking about? No one. Okay. So it's just like basically it was like a Sunday night massacre where just like suddenly signatures got lumped in. And the irony of the whole thing is that. Barney Frank, the guy who writes the legislation that actually creates a lot of the like kind of uh, stagnation in the, the banking industry because it adds a whole bunch of additional regulation, is on the board of Signature. And he, he's like, wait a second, but why are we getting put into receivership? And, and so he has a little bit of a mouthbeat. I mean, he's retired at this point, but he, he, I think, went on the record and said basically it's like there was no, there were no deposit issues. We had a diversified client base. And he he supposed that it basically was an execution because there was uh, a a lot of crypto clients and they just basically wanted to be able to wipe out wipe out the bank. Um, but but to your point, Nick, maybe maybe the signature equity shareholders who now probably you know lost everything are going to have some amount of discovery and lawsuit that that we find out that the decision making wasn't as uh, you know banking crisis oriented and more there was a political goal that they could conveniently sweep under the rug as the SBB thing was blowing up. Yeah, that's that's the specific one to focus on, for sure. If we're looking for lawlessness or arbitrariness, the signature equity was only worth four point three billion uh, on Friday, close of business. A few months before it, it was actually twenty two billion. So this wasn't a small bank. They had over a hundred billion in deposits, and uh, or in assets at that point, they had reduced the size of their crypto practice to about ten billion in deposits. So it was only 10%. Actually, turns out they were asked to reduce it below 15% following the FTX crisis. So this is something that I don't think is publicly known. FDIC went to all of these banks in November of 2022 and said, as part of your routine data sharing, we need you to identify all of your crypto clients to us on an ongoing basis. And you need to identify them by name and you need to clear with us the names of new crypto clients. So an extremely intrusive level of oversight. They also, what they didn't do at that point was clear that with the Office of Management and Budget, which this is kind of like an esoteric thing, but basically you're meant to do that if you're going to update uh, a template form where you're asking banks for information. You're meant to ask them first. They didn't do that. Um, so S Signature had reduced the size of their crypto practice. Of course, their main practice is lending to like landlords in New York. The other thing that's particularly suspicious is Signet, which is their fiat settlement network, their sort of inter-firm real-time settlement network. You know, blockchains settle in real time, fiat settles during banking hours. So the mismatch creates enormous issues. So you have to 
create a parallel network which settles at the same speed. After Sen was closed down, Signet was the last one standing. Signet was actually bigger than Sen, and that was a pretty critical piece of crypto infrastructure. So it would have been a really juicy target for DFS at that point. And um, you know, there's a lot of short sellers out there saying, "Well, this was a hotbed of criminality, this and that." I guess we'll find out the truth there, but to me, it appears that DFS had a very strong motive to use the crisis to put signature into receivership to take down the last explicitly pro crypto bank and specifically the one that was running this Signet settlement network. Nick, can we ask you a question to change it up a little bit? And it's a question we asked Bern Hobart, who we had on before as well. And it's a question I often ask myself. You know, obviously, you know, I, I'm a crypto company now. I'm getting, we have like DeFi clients. And so we're getting deeper and deeper a lot of these protocols. I used to work in, in conventional finance. I was a quant on the, on the Goldman Trading Desk ages ago. Um, and it, it's interesting to me to see certain things develop in DeFi. A lot of the things are speed running what the conventional banking system has done a lot, for, you know, for a lot of the time, run up speculation, runs, et cetera. Like none of this is novel. They're, they're just speed running. But some of it actually is quite novel, actually. Right. And I'm curious. How much of like a lot of what you're talking about is basically the old legacy system colliding with the new system, right? And like, and and we can jump through all the hoops and talk all about all the tactical news about it. But at a higher level, how much of the financial system that that we see operative right now is a legacy of basically the analog era, in which you know, sovereign debt and corporate bonds and some notion of equity and very sort of leg legacy financial instruments that date back. I think Dan called it to like a 16th century Dutch jurist, right? who you know, issued a statement about how ship payloads should be recompensed on loss or some shit that like spun all of capitalism as we know it in, into existence. And now we're kind of rebooting it with crypto. And I'm curious, like you can already see that there, like there's no bonds. In, well, there is lending in crypto, but there aren't corporate bonds in the conventional sense. And you can see already that like things are going in a slightly different direction. I'm curious if that means that the global financial re reboot that that crypto potentially represents it, you know, I, I, I think Dan and I said that like we believe in crypto because it's obviously the native financial system for the fully online virtual digital world, right? What does that mean then that you don't have, you know, corporate bonds backed up by a factory in Kansas, right? Which was the operative way you floated money for a very long time. So as in like how much of crypto is genuinely novel or just like recreating TradFi on a different technological substrate? Yes, yes. So... There's some stuff which is novel, like a flash loan doesn't have an analogy in traditional land, which, which may be good because flash loans are pretty dangerous <laughs> as far as I can tell. Well, I, in, in Wall Street, I mean, I, I would call that a repo transaction, right? A lot of banks fund themselves with, with flash loans in which they fund the position they take with some other, either their own repo desk or another one. Um, I think one tendency you definitely see is that instruments that only exist at the Goldman level are suddenly available to retail people. But yes, offering repo loans to the average person maybe is, is novel enough that it's its own separate thing. For the most part, we're just rebuilding things that exist already, but in a fundamentally better way. Um, so an example, easy example, so just on a flatter hierarchy. Um, and I think that's really good overall. So there's like two things that I think are really important that crypto does. One is homogenize these financial networks into single flat layers with potential we'll add more layers later, but um, take what is an intensely hierarchical system in TradFi and flatten it into single layers, so basically interoperability. So in the traditional fiat world, interoperability is basically non-existent i mean you have payment networks but they're certainly not globalized um if you want to move dollars from you know i don't know sub-saharan africa to the philippines that has to go through new york so it is super hierarchical there's specific nodes which really matter in those networks and those nodes have amazing amounts of political power which is why sanctions are so effective the u.s government can shut anyone off the network so if you think about a public blockchain anyone can be sort of equal on that network right anybody can get read access or write access so for stable coins for instance that's like having a you know an i mean you know you basically the equivalent of a u.s dollar bank account 
all of a sudden anybody globally can have that access. Um, so I think that's really, really novel. It's not sort of, uh, we're not re-envisioning anything, any core financial primitive there, but we are proposing a new model of governance basically whereby we've stripped out the power from any specific individual node. And that goes far beyond just stable coins, but think about DeFi. So that's genuinely democratizing. I know that that's like a buzzword in crypto, but I think giving people globally the ability to access payments and you know, smart contracts on a shared single state is really, really powerful. And you know, over the next decade, we'll probably see like crypto dollarization. We'll see uh, the state level monetary discretion will be eroded because of this. The other thing is simply restoring some measure of financial privacy to the world. That's also not a new thing. That's just taking us back to a previous era. So I call it like a revanchist thing. So we're just restoring some territory that we once had that we lost where as things became digitized commensurately financial privacy was lost there's specific things you can point to uh, but basically it just became easier to surveil people i would say the bank secrecy act and the third party doctrine in the us um, those are the main things the other thing is just everything became digitized so easier to surveil we basically forsook all financial privacy in this country it basically doesn't exist and so rebuilding the notion of cash, but in a digital context, like if you think about cash transaction, like that's truly private under a certain threshold and there's no intermediation whatsoever, like physical cash transaction, rebuilding that in a digital way, that's very powerful. So I'd say those are the two important things. And those are not new financial primitives at all, but they're, like intensely important and i think i think there probably are things that we could specifically say are news like especially some of the primitives that we see emerging in DeFi. but at the most abstract level i think those are the two most important things we're doing here i mean you're making the consumer case which is the right case to make i think for most people because then they sort of get it to me and again this is like the former quant speaking what, what i find interesting is that you have DeFi protocols that that again they're not inventing anything new right but you've got you've got some crazy derivatives exchange the trades interest rate swaps or options on currencies or whatever. And then on the other side, they have some liquidity staking pool. And it's exactly what Goldman does, right? I mean, Goldman, like the, the, the secret is investment banks actually have no money. They go, they go out into the markets and they fund at like LIBOR plus 90 BIPs or whatever they're funding at now. So they actually go out to the market and borrow and then take highly levered bets that they manage risk on very well. And that's that's exactly what DeFi protocols do. And that, and, and that is the nature of financial engineering, right? You take one sort of risk that, that, like, that the economy pumps out and you transform it into the into the sort of risk that the capital markets actually want. And so people want to place bets on whether a, a, a 100x levered bet on Ethereum going up and down, right? Who's like a total DJ and who's like hunting around like crazy. And then on the other side, there's some guy who just wants 5% on the Ether. <laughs> and somehow you bring them together in exchange and it all kind of works. And that's exactly that's exactly what Goldman does. So to me, like, I mean, this is this is the the, the base case for crypto, even if it ends up just recreating a lot of what was in Goldman, but just not with the Goldman's in the picture. To me, it's already like worth doing, right? In the same sense that um, like GDC is this week, right? Which is a gaming development conference. It was like literally up the street from where I'm sitting right now. And it's like a lot of what the games are doing isn't that different with the, than what they were already doing, frankly. But it's but putting it on chain makes it cool and interesting in other ways. But that that already makes it interesting because I mean there's a whole new set of game players that or, or game development studios that didn't exist before. And so um to those of us who believe that you know we're living in a Western decadence and we need a global reboot of society. In some sense, crypto is part of that reboot in that everything from Goldman to Facebook is just going to get like kind of wrecked and probably not make the hop into this new world. And hopefully this, this world actually goes big enough to be on our way to it. I, th I don't think the case for crypto is that hard to make, to be honest. I mean, for me, the main thing is just depoliticizing finance. And I think of it like electricity or water, like it shouldn't be politicized that you have access to this resource, which is the ability to participate in the economy. And at every level of the stack, it's highly politicized. So at the sovereign level, you know, now it's risky to hold treasuries or dollars if you feel that you might offend the US government in some way. 
And we can debate the merits of that. Obviously, from the national security perspective, people like that that's the status quo, that the U.S. has the ability to project power that way. But for the most part, anyone that's not the U.S. government hates that, including our allies. They all generally resent this. And you could fall afoul of the U.S. government and then your treasuries are frozen. We saw this with Russia. It's like a G20 nation, you know, and it's not, certainly not the only one who frozen their sovereign assets. So it's politicized there. At lower levels of the stack, it's politicized at these fintechs and payment processors. Your ability to do business is a function of your whether your political views are deemed acceptable by you know the Trust and Safety Commission uh, at these at these startups at these firms. So everywhere I look, I see, and obviously in banking, you know, this is what we're talking about right now. Banking has become politicized. What industries banks can do business with and and they can't? That's a political thing. And it may serve people well in the current administration. They may think, well, the, the correct political decisions are being made. But you can't assume that's going to be the status quo forever. I mean, the administration could change. And then you're falling on the wrong side of the stick there. So I think it's very simple. It's just finance has become wrongly politicized. And it's completely valid to look for an alternative. And I think that's really the essence of what, of what crypto tries to do. You know, it's funny, I'm thinking in, in the road to, to be total libertarian, in the road to th- uh, serfdom, Hayek said that uh, control over the means of production is control over life itself, right? In the chapter about why the communists would always seize the sort of means of production, in a post-industrial economy, control over the money supply is control over life itself, right? And uh, it's funny, you know, uh, Mozambique has the craziest flag. There's actually like an arm with an AK-47. I think if the Bellagio network state ever happens, it's going to be like a flag with like a Bitcoin symbol on it, because that was in some sense the tool of liberation for it. Just to, just to channel the ghost of Bology, which we had on last Dude, episode. I think his 17, um, 1729 flag is a Bitcoin flag network state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, is it? Oh, God, is I didn't know that. State. So that yeah. Was, yeah. He has an actual flag. <laughs> he already has a flag. Yeah. yeah. I, I think like one, one point you bring up that I, I think I never had an opinion on this until working at Coinbase and having to deal with Fiat Rails and thinking about partners is how politicized the financial system is. It doesn't hit most people most of the time, and, and you hear the, like the Canada whatever trucker thing, and that that's like an extreme case. But like, let's just talk practical. Like the, the there's like a whole class of legal industries in the United States that, because of political pressure through the banks, have basically been cut off from the the financial system. Um, really basic example for anyone listening. Just type prohibited uh, businesses Stripe into Google and just read the, the, the document that they basically all businesses that Stripe, which is in theory like economic infrastructure for the Internet, uh, they, don't, they don't support card payments for. Now, to be fair to Stripe, that has probably nothing to do with Stripe's like, point of view, is they get this handed down to them from their banking partner and or Visa and MasterCard. And, and so... This is actually something I was arguing kind of with Bology the other day. I was like, he's like, oh, Fed now is coming. And it's like, you know, this is this is the panopticon that is going to come and just take control of the entire banking system. I, Visa MasterCard are already there. Like they they can shut off a bin so fast. We had this actually happen once at Coinbase where we were still approved for Visa debit cards and and and, and credit cards. And so we have our app. And there was like a mistake or something, and they just uh, like we had customers getting their their accounts debited incorrectly, and we hadn't we were completely at the whim of Visa. And so I'm I'm this is like a Friday. I'm trying to get on the call. Like I ended up talking. To the, the guy's now actually the CEO of Visa because he was basing us up. And I finally got a meeting with him on Monday, and and I was like, this is unacceptable. Like you guys like you had all these debits. Now people are blaming Coinbase when it's actually a Visa issue. And he's like, so. Like we're basically a monopoly. Like we don't have to listen to you. Like, you know, you're not going to go to Mastercard. You still need Visa. And so, like the the fact that we kind of live in this world today and and people are okay with it is like, okay, well, if it doesn't hit you, it doesn't matter. But if you're OnlyFans or you're some prohibited business, you know, not just crypto. It's just like your your ability to participate in the modern economy can be turned off like that and extra judicial, right? Like there is no law that got passed. It's just you got on the wrong side of some politician who pushes the the regulator who then is like, oh, shit, I have a letter from Elizabeth Warren now. I, I, I need to show that I'm doing something because I'm a bureaucrat and I want my pension. So I'm going to keep pushing. And then it's the bank that shuts you off. 
And I'd say that's the crux of it, though, which is we have a kind of a social contract in this country where we abide by the law and that's explicit and we know what the rules of the road are. But when we see banks being weaponized against private sector industries or we see big tech companies that have financial products that are acting as outsourced arms of the government, there is no recourse because it's not written policy anywhere. The rules of the road are changing in real time. You have nothing, no ability to deal with that. You can't vote out someone at the FDIC or the OCC. So that's the insidious part, at least in my view, which is that it is extrajudicial. That's absolutely the case here. We have written guidance in some cases here coming down from the financial regulators, but it's mostly informal. Just to take the anti-biology position for a second, in some sense, isn't crypto just back-end loading the problem? Like, okay, you don't depend on Visa to actually transfer money, but it's when it assumes fiat that like the fiat rails are what really matter, right? Which is what we're talking about. What is the solution to that other than, you know, lobbying and trying to normalize crypto? Like, what is the biology solution? Is it constitutional amendment about, you know, the right to crypto as a form of free speech? Is it the Bellagio network state in which Bitcoin actually is the native currency and then there is no fiat effective? Like, what is the out other than begging the feds not to, not to crush us? I, I can't but, give you the biology. I mean, I could uh, suppose what biology would say, which probably is move to a Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction and then get out of dollars. But the... The practical thing is one, you have to allow new bank creation in the United States. Like it, it was, it's always been the case. Like, I mean, you can go Google wildcat banking. Like th there's a rich history of banking in the United States, good and bad, but, but the ability for someone who is like, Hey, I want to offer a differentiated service in the market, follow the laws. Right. But like, if, if, you know, you, you are pro firearms and you realize that all of these firearm companies and firearm adjacent companies basically don't have any payment processing and you want to go build a bank and follow all of the laws that are, are written by Congress and states, you should be able to go do that. But right now it's effectively, it's like, no, no, we don't issue new bank charters. Sorry. And it's just like, well, wait a second. Like, that, that, like there's a process for this. Why aren't you, why aren't you processing the, the charter? And, and there's no accountability on that. And I think like, um, I, I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I, I heard at one point, basically, the reason Visa and MasterCard haven't already flipped on like firearms, like they, they're always kind of tweaking on the edges is because Walmart is like, you drop it, like we will, we will just build Walmart pay and like all this other kind of stuff, because that's how big they are in terms of just like as a customer. And they want to be able to sell firearms in the States that they have. But it's like, that's like that industry is not very far off from being completely cut off. And, and whether or not you think that that should be supported is the reality is they're legal. And so like, we shouldn't have these extrajudicial systems regulating like, oh, I, I don't think firearms should be legal, so I'm, I'm now okay with all of the payment systems shutting them off. When the reality is, like, if you actually want it to get changed, change it at congressional level or realistically change it with a, a constitutional amendment. The firearms was the target of the first choke point initiative uh, in 2013. So anyone in that business will be intimately familiar with what's happening to crypto right now. I like the pun with Target, by the way. I was just thinking, I've actually bought a firearm on the internet. I'm trying to remember how I paid for it. It might have been a bank wire. Yeah, the two things you have to buy with bank wires, firearms and Rolexes. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's... There is some drama around the credit networks are being pressured to collect information on anyone using a credit card to purchase a firearm right now. Uh, so there's a bit of a back and forth on it. So they're basically being deputized to create a registry of firearm own owners, not and so that becomes a constitutional issue, but it's not the government doing it. It's a private entity. Um, and so that's another reason why it's insidious is those constitutional protections not apply to corporate power. And so that's why it's so convenient for the state to deputize private corporate entities to do their dirty work for them. Of course, with banks, banks are not really private entities, arguably. Arguably, they're extensions of the state. We see this more and more with the state now like backstopping the banks, fewer banks, highly regulated. So I think banks should be subject to a different treatment where they should be actually treated as part of the government or much less a private entity, which is why I think they're deserving of much more scrutiny here. I mean, they did the same thing with the FISA warrants and, and the Patriot Act, right? It's like you deputize all the, the telecom providers to, to go collect all the information. So they're not technically doing it. And then whenever they need access to it, they just get a little warrant and they know it's already there. But they, they help design the systems. So it's like you using these kind of like big Fortune 500 companies 
to do all this this dirt, political dirty work that would be illegal if, if the government was doing it. Um, I don't know. I think it's a much bigger issue than than most people think. Yeah, there's actually a really weird case for a CBDC to be made here, and I don't want this to get clipped out of context. But if there was a gl- retail CBDC that was government administered, you would be more protected in that case by your fundamental constitutional protections, uh, your rights to privacy and uh, due process and um, it, no unreasonable search and seizure as compared to the status quo where the third party doctrine, for instance, specifies that all information that your bank has, they can just freely share that with the government without your consent. Um, so you'd actually be more protected under maybe a first amendment basis if there was a CBDC, assuming that the government wasn't going completely haywire at that point as compared to kind of the established financial system. That doesn't mean a CBDC is good, but uh, that's actually an argument that people make sometimes. Can you define what a CBDC is? Sorry, just as a, for just a general context, because I don't, even I don't deeply understand it. And I analogize it, the digital dollar the Cuban government has, which maybe is the wrong analogy. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no one good definition in this case. I was just referring to maybe a retail CBDC, whereby we would be banking directly with the Federal Reserve. Um, and uh, so that's actually kind of similar to like holding treasuries directly. So you're lending to the government itself. And then, but then on top of that, there'd be some payment system that'd be layered on top of that. That's not the way that CBDCs are generally envisioned in the West, although we don't have any good examples. So it's kind of hard to reason about it right now. I think one, one way to think about it, Antonio, is like basically what USDC is, which if you know you follow what they do is they basically buy treasuries, is if it wasn't run by a private company and it was just sitting at the Fed and then they, they were administering it. And with USDC, there's a blacklist. They can actually just nuke an address um, at any point. Like there's with no recourse, like, and it's just on the blockchain, they can just blacklist it. And I think they can actually revoke the the funds. I'm not exactly sure what the compliance requirements are there, which is kind of interesting, but you can imagine in a kind of dystopian version, if, if everyone now is using that at any point, you just can have all of your assets frozen by the, the centrally administered CBDC. Well, China, China has a version. I don't actually know what, what the latest is on that, but the kind of paranoid take on that is just like, they're doing it because this is additional control over the population, right? It's like, they've effectively had a quasi CBDC in the sense that WeChat and Alipay, the, the two primary ways of doing payments in China. I don't, I don't know if you guys been to China recently, like I was there probably seven years ago or, and uh, it's crazy just like that you can't use a credit card. Visa, MasterCard, absolutely, like maybe at your hotel, but like everywhere else, if you go to a restaurant, you just have the QR code on the wall and everyone's just scanning it with the phone, sending it via Alipay or, or you know, WeChat. But that's obviously a, a, an organ of the state, the, the country, in the sense that that's completely uh, captured by the CCP. Is the CBDC on, ch- on chain, by the way? Just a quick question. It's, a, it's its own chain, potentially, but it, like there are different implementations. So I, um, I met with recently the individual at the um, whatever, the Chinese central bank that's administering their CBDC. And uh, he was actually extolling its, uh, he had some really funny euphemism, like conditional privacy or something like that, actually just trying to talk up the privacy preserving features of the system, which really tickled me. But apparently, as far as I can tell, the CBDC is actually being outcompeted by the private sector alternatives right now. Um, I guess because governments can't design UIs that are as good as the private sector. <laughs> so there's some like hopeful, maybe green shoots there that even in China, the CBDC is not dominating right now. So, so the, the bull case for a CBDC, and I don't actually think the government would implement it like this. So this is why I wouldn't want it. But if it was to be implemented at like kind of like a, 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 like a basic, very simple blockchain type level, and the ability for me to be able to move my funds between different institutions, but now you have kind of this this blockchain. So then effectively what you have is a development platform that I can actually go build a competing Visa MasterCard, right? Because what is Visa MasterCard? It's actually routing instructions, debiting, crediting the different banks and and kind of doing all that in addition to fraud prevention, right? Because if we move to an actual like digital cash version of the world, there's no such thing as a chargeback, right? 
But in a world where now all of a sudden the actual root layer of the the actual digital dollars is a blockchain and, and a kind of like development platform, you would have overnight a whole bunch of competitors to Visa and MasterCard because everyone speaks this digital dollar, right? Everyone speaks USDC uh, equivalent. And so that that gets to a situation where you have like massive amount of consumer benefit because now Visa and MasterCard can't just sit on their laurels being these monopolies. Like you, you actually would have competing networks um, that would either be catering to different types of merchants or different types of consumers. Um, and so, so there is a version where it would work but I just don't trust it to not be like a, a massive tool for, for surveillance. Well, the main problem I have with it is that it just eliminates commercial banks. Um, because why would you hold your deposits in a commercial bank, especially if there's the un unsecured deposits right above the FDIC threshold, when you could just bank with the government directly? And then, of course, there's no counterparty risk unless you think the US government's going to default. And, but commercial banks play this incredibly valuable function which is maturity transformation, taking in deposits and lending long. And in particular, small and medium-sized banks, they are really the cornerstone of the economy. They lend to the small and medium-sized businesses, right? That's where credit really comes from. So in a CBDC world, who does that function? You know, who is, who is evaluating businesses and lending to them? Who's creating that credit? So you do need that. That's a socially very valuable function. And it doesn't seem right to remand that power back to the government for them to now be the sole entity that determines the allocation of credit, right? I mean, there's a Hayekian case to be made here that credit should be allocated by the free market, not by the government. So that's really my issue with the CBDC is that, uh, you know, commercial banks actually play a vital role and it would totally disintermediate them. Yeah, I think the credit point's actually pretty good. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. So, I mean, like we were with Bern Herbert last week and just talking about like, you know, it's a dirty word within especially a lot of crypto folks, but the reality is like credit is an amazing invention in terms of the, the growth of Western civilization is, is directly correlated to the, the development of uh, more and more sophistication as it relates to credit. Because what it's effectively saying is it's like, I, I don't have to worry about like what I have now, I can bet on the future. And if I trust this entire system and I think there are fair critiques on whether how much you can trust it. But as a society overall, if we can all agree that like, if I take the dollars today and I can promise to pay you back in the future, you, you get a lot of productivity gains, right? And just like increase in, in overall human well-being. Yeah. If there's one group in crypto that I have the biggest quarrel with, it's not even any specific coin interest group. It's actually with the like crypto Rothbardians that don't believe in quote unquote fractional reserve. And that believe in this mythical world of exclusively full reserve banking, which we've never had, by the way. There's no market derived banking regime where all of the banks have been full reserved. That has never occurred in history. If you eliminate all regulations on banking, you eliminate the central bank, you will have a fractional reserve system. We have plenty of historical evidence for this. Look at the free banking era in Scotland. That was a very successful era, there was no central bank. There's very limited bank regulation. There were very few bank failures. There was not a lot of financial instability. Inflation was low. Reserve ratios were on average two to five percent. So in a like a truly free market context and in successful historical epics of banking, it's still fractional reserve. The full reserve people, they are indulging in basically a fantasy we've never had. So it's not like we can go back to the you know glorious prior era of full reserve banking. We never had that. That's not something that the market actually gives us. It's just fundamentally more efficient to have fractional reserve. Yeah, just as a comment on the credit thing, it's a good point, Dan. In fact, at the in my book Chaos Monkeys, there's a chapter on Goldman Sachs when I worked at Goldman, and it actually opens with a quote from an um, an inscription that used to be on the on the building of the SM, of Standard and Poor's actually downtown. That's a quote from, I think, Rockefeller or somebody said that nothing has moved the industry more than credit, which is a little ironic in the case of Standard & Poor's uh, you know, impl involvement with the credit crisis. But it, but it is true. I'm, I'm curious, getting back to the point of like, what is legacy and what's going to survive the hop to DeFi versus not? There doesn't seem to be a lot of credit, right? Or a fractional reserve. Like most loans are over collateralized or, or instantly slashed. Is that due to the nature of like pseudo, you know, pseudonymity or anonymity and the transience of identity on DeFi? And that's like a limitation of DeFi? Uh, or are we going to get over that somehow? 
how is credit going to work or, or, or fractional reserve? There's protocols on DeFi which introduce credit, so the under-reserved lending, but they all of them currently have a legal wrapper so that there's recourse in the like legal traditional world. So there's actually been a fair like billions of dollars worth of uh, under collateralized lending in DeFi with just DeFi's routing the infrastructure. But it's a hybrid system which is still reliant on that tether to laws, basically. I think it becomes much more in- interesting when we have persistent identity in DeFi where you have some motivation to keep and sustain a single identity, even if pseudonymous and then engage in transactions that build up your credit history. I know that's been like a holy grail of DeFi. I don't know if you guys know of any successful examples of this so far. Well, there's one company that we started working with in the spindle context called Rockify, R-O-C-I-F-I. And the way they actually compel you to tether to one wallet is that they compute a credit score. So they'll look at all the transactions associated with that wallet, and give you a credit score, and they literally have a curve with, which is how collateralized your loan needs to be based on your credit score. So you would have an incentive to build uh, an actual credit score with them in order to get deeper funding. I don't know. Something I think a lot about is like, if you think of the EVM as this kind of like really interesting thing that powers Ethereum and all these other chains and like the composability and interoperability allows you to build all this cool shit. But like, what, what is the actual fundamental thing that's allowed the US and, and modern society to build up what it is? It's, it's, it's like to use a like cheeky thing. It's like the BCL, British common law. Right. It's like British common law, like you, you, you know, combination of like Dutch and British and then just like all of those court cases compounded on, on each other with whatever those precedents with with the financial instruments that get Im- implemented. And naturally it was like, OK, well, France is a shit country to do anything financial, because if you just get on the wrong side of the king, they just seize everything from you. Same, you know, other places. And so it ended up in London and then basically the U.S. and it kind of U.S. imports this version of the BCL and then. From there, it's it's the, that economic institution and, and legal institution. Fast forward 200 years is that's that's the reason it works is because there's a whole court system that will actually allow you to to make sure that that credit is going to be good. And at the end of the day, underneath there are men with men with guns to enforce it, right? And so I think that the thing with with crypto is like what is the equivalent? Like I think the EVM is the equivalent of the like British common law, and, and we're speed running that. But I do think that the the challenge, and, and maybe it just requires a completely new paradigm for someone to think about, but is like, what is the men with guns equivalent last, last, last recourse within crypto? Because until then, I don't think there's just too much fraud anonymously on the internet to actually move to a credit-based system. But, but I think someone smart would probably figure out some native way to do it on the internet. And, and maybe it's, you know, credit scores or whatever, but think that that's the uh i think that's the biggest challenge on, on moving from this like very collateralized world of crypto instruments and DeFi to the the credit-based world or abolish becomes a warlord that, that's the other solution <laughs> network state baby I, i've been trying to push him to it but he doesn't seem receptive to the idea i have to say nick what what's your what's your take on the the 90 day million dollar bet i think balaji feels that it's an opportune moment for a talismanic leader to emerge in bitcoin and if you look at the prior leaders in bitcoin they've almost all been clowns or just kind of really deficient in some way so i'm personally i'm glad that balaji is currently the loudest and most important bitcoiner because i think he's much smarter and better spoken just all around more intelligent than any of the other ones that we've had and his case is also just based in reason as opposed to dogma the bet i'm a little confused about i'll I'll admit i don't think he can win that but at the same time if he if his bet provokes like a change in sentiment um and you know helps push some people that are on the fence over the edge just to show conviction like that then if bitcoin you know, whatever appreciates to fifty thousand dollars within the time, everyone's going to forget that he lost the bet. No one will care because he'll just be credited with catalyzing this run. So I think he can still win the bet even if he loses the bet. Basically, yeah. I think um, the thing that I think is genius about it, regardless, is like one, he's making an argument, and you know, you can it's falsifiable, so you can kind of see how it plays out. Willing to put the skin in, skin in the game, and it's significant amount of skip in the game 
there's some like stupid arguments like, oh, well, what percentage of his net worth? If it's not, then it's not actually, it's like, no, a million dollars is a shelling point number. It's like, you know, if he had said 800,000, it would have gotten like half the attention that the fact that it's a million. And so I think it's a million dollar marketing expense more than anything else to, to actually now be driving the intellectual discussion around this whole part of the internet. Right. Like, and so I, I think, uh, I think he's going to be the main character for the next 90 days. And, and to the degree that like he is able to catalyze things in a way that he, you know, people are excited about, he's going to end up having a, a bigger dedicated audience from it. Um, he, he would, he would challenge that and say, that's not why he's doing it. I, I'm just, I'm observing from, from my standpoint is that it seems like a real reasonable, good, reasonably good trade for him. Um, notwithstanding on like whether or not like, you know, the price of Bitcoin, like, I, I don't actually have any idea of where it's going to I be. thought it was funny that he compared it to the Simon Ehrlich wager. So this, this was a bet between like this um, ecologist, Paul Ehrlich, who actually I know personally because we were neighbors growing up, um, which is really weird because he's one of the main, he wrote this book called The Population Bomb in the 1970s, arguing that we didn't have enough resources. He was like a, basically a neo-Malthusian. He felt that we didn't have enough resources to support population growth and so he's like one of the main environmentalist doomers from the 70s like when we really started to get concerned about it for the first time and he made this bet with an economist that i believe that commodity he felt that commodity prices would go up because they would become really scarce as population kind of like outstripped the world's carrying capacity and the other guy was like no actually technology makes commodity extraction cheaper and he was right Simon was right by a lot. He like resoundingly won that bet. But um, it didn't dis the weird thing is Ehrlich lost the bet, but he wasn't really discredited by it, even though he lost like horrendously. In fact, Paul Ehrlich is the guy that everyone remembers. He was on like CBS like a month ago, still on basically spreading the same narrative that the earth is like running out of resources and, and, uh, you know, technologically, we can't keep up and we're going to run like run out of key resources and then become extinct. So it's I don't know. I don't know who in the bet Balaji is analogizing himself to. In that case, the loser of the bet was still by far the more more notorious of the two. Yeah, he's, he's still doom. He's still a doomer, right? He's still like this voice for it, even though he's and he's never if you really, he's never really acknowledged the loss. I think he did pay the bet. And then the other the other thing, of course, is he's a famous Stanford guy who says what Sort of liberal elites one here, and the other guy I think was not nearly as famous and was like at a second tier institution. Or like was at Stanford. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the pin on a grenade and toss it into the group and then bail, as is my want. Nick, who should crypto people want to win in the 2024 pres presidential election? <laughs> I don't think it's close. I mean, <laughs> if you look at what's happening with choke point 2.0, uh, you know the Biden administration is intensely hostile to crypto at every at every level. Uh, I know people. Like a lot of lobbyists that I talked to always cautioned me, like, don't make crypto a partisan issue. It wasn't me that made it a partisan issue. It was politicians that made it a partisan issue by generally having Republicans generally be in favor of it and Democrats, for the most part, being against it. So, I mean, I think you want DeSantis. I don't know if he'll even be the nominee, but he's clearly much more pro crypto than Trump. And uh, another four years of Biden. Honestly, I think would be catastrophic for the crypto industry here. Another two years is existential, uh, but another four years would be like you would see people actually going offshore for real and like physically moving. Do you think crypto will unify and support the Republican candidate? Because tech is you know ninety eight percent left. Or, or, or I I think it's pretty clear um, if you're a single issue voter where you should vote, but crypto is not the like top of mind thing for most people. What do you think is going to happen? Um, how do you think the banking situation is going to is going to play out? So there's already so I feel like I've done my bit, which is basically to try and synthesize the developments and talk to a lot of bankers and basically get that information on the record. And I'm now handing the baton off to like folks in the Republican, how you know, financial services committee that will actually be now interviewing. Uh, these regulators and asking them the tough questions that they need. Just 
interviewing someone under oath and getting their honest answers as to why they shuttered Signature. Were they insolvent? Did Silvergate have specific critical lines of credit withdrawn at the 11th hour? Things like that. Getting those answers is going to be really essential. Beyond that, so there's that's one. And the House being Republican means they can they have subpoena authority, which is really important. Beyond that, it's legal. So I think there's a number of legal challenges that can be brought in particular to DFS, sending signature into receivership. Uh, and then lastly, there are market mechanisms. So like there is a gap now. There were 30 billion of deposits that were crypto focused at Signature and Silvergate. They need to find a home. So there are banks moving into that space. They do face impediments to building up their book there. But there certainly are banks that see an opportunity there despite the opposition from regulators. So those are the three things that I think will basically tilt the pendulum back. Yeah, my... I'm generally more optimistic, but the more cynical is I think that the congressional stuff will be a little bit of a circus. It'll be like a, a big moment for us and, and larger credit to you, Nick, in, in terms of running this off the flagpole. But I, but I think it's like, you know, you'll have these clips and it'll just be so egregious. And then because they're unelected bureaucrats and they don't really get that much pressure, like there's actually not going to be any real change there. It may make them pull back a bit from whatever leaning on the table they've been doing, where they, now they don't really want to have another one of these happen. But um, I, I, I'm more optimistic to your point is that there are banks who are going to look at these deposits and go, great, like, like how, how do we get this business? But I suspect it's going to be, and I think you brought this up earlier, there are going to be banks that just don't want to be labeled crypto banks. They are going to have a quiet policy that gets out there that if you if you kind of are plugged in and have the right investors or in the right network, you're going to find your way there. And then people are just going to keep that close to the chest, which is actually that's kind of how it how, is today, actually. Yeah, yeah. But 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 that's that's how even like when we were at Coinbase, like we never talked about banking relationships publicly because it was like, oh, we don't really want to attract any attention from press. We don't want to attract any attention from regulators anymore. And, and certainly we don't want all of our competitors to go in to this other bank and they're the one that doesn't have the good compliance program that blows everything up. But, but I do think like the reality, I mean, how many banks are still in the US? 10,000, 5,000. It's, it's still an, an enormous number of banks in the US. And, and having been the guy having to go find new banks to do crypto stuff, it, it will be possible. It just will require work. The, the thing that I am most worried about and I don't have any, there's no information on this that like I think is eminent. It's just like, if you shut off Coinbase in the US, just with a couple of bank relationships through some regulatory kind of soft pressure, you have a serious, serious impact on liquidity in the market. Because imagine if, if you shut off Coinbase, Robinhood is going and so is Square. And so it's like, you, you've effectively got off 80 to 90% of the, the retail pipes. And then even the institutional stuff, it, it gets a lot harder and so I think you could really have a, a crypto nuclear winter. I, I do think at some point it would come back because to your point, I think it's become a political issue. And so inevitably, whenever the Republicans control enough of the you know, Congress plus the administration, you probably can get a bill in that, that guarantees access or, or, or some amount of direct access to the, the Fed system. But I, I, I genuinely like I have not felt this like scared or tenuous banking situation since since like 2015. Yeah. Um, so. It's interesting right now. I could tell you there's 15 or so banks that are still taking crypto clients with a lot of asterisks, frankly. They don't just take you off the street, but they don't want their names at all mentioned in that context. So they know. They saw what happened to the two pro crypto banks. They were decapitated. <laughs> you know, like Silvergate was wrongly shuttered or signature, sorry. I think that will become excruciatingly clear in the coming months. So these the, the executives of these banks will onboard crypto firms within certain constraints. I already mentioned the 15% deposit rule. They also get daily calls from FGIC demanding lists of their crypto clients. They ask for, the FGIC asks for proactive upfront authorization of new crypto business, which is like a completely crazy thing. Imagine that for any other industry. Way, way, way overstepping, right? Like they should be worried about just like the solvency and like making sure that the bank is, is healthy, 
not approving individual customers. Yeah, and I mean, look at the actual cause of the ultimate systemic risk. Like, there is a widespread financial crisis here, which has very little to do with crypto. It has much more to do with the price of bonds, right? Say, say more about that, Nick. Like, how do you, how do you think that's going to to play out? I mean, do, do you think a lot of the banks are, you know, would say most of them are insolvent already? H- how do you think this this is going to play out or should play out? Yeah, I mean, on a mark to mark basis, these banks are insolvent, and that's just a very plain mathematical function of rising interest rates. Rising interest rates drive down the value of bonds mathematically. Someone has to take that duration risk. The risk has to go somewhere. It's banks that normally take it. They have to put deposits somewhere. They borrow short and lend long. It's not that the banks made bad decisions. Okay, some of them had more mismanaged versus less mismanaged portfolios. They all had exposure to long bonds. That's what banks do. So it's you know it's a, just a necessary and natural outcome that hiking rates very quickly which is, of course, if the ultimate cause is the inflationary impulse, which we can debate the cause of that, but I think that has to do with the fiscal expenditure during COVID in particular, hiking rates very quickly leads to banks being imperiled. So, so what are our options? Like, what, what can we do here? You could just cut rates. You could cut rates, right? That actually solves the problem. <laughs> and, and then we'd have inflation? Because the, the price of the bonds... The asset value yeah. go up. <laughs> the, the treasuries literally go up in value from the power value. At, at what like cost, the, right? Will, will that have, have inflation? Well, see, that's the problem. This is People talk about the Fed being trapped. They're literally actually trapped now, like very genuinely trapped because we're all at 6% CPI. Otherwise, like the UK is at 10% inflation. So you revert to a looser rate environment when inflation is still structurally high. This is what a lot of us expected. But easing into an inflationary environment is like Argentina tier crazy town. So they may try and keep those rates high, but that threatens the solvency and just the integrity of the banking system completely. And basically what happens from here is people crowd into money market funds to hold treasuries directly. They crowd into government debt or into the largest systemic institutions. They totally desert the regional and the community banks. So that's what you can expect in the status quo is a die off of banks, massive consolidation, deposits leave the banking system, less credit is created, massive recessionary drag on GDP. Or you can cut rates and inflation goes to the absolute moon. There's really no good options, but we're going to have to pick one of those options. By the way, that's actually something that we never really got to talk with Balaji is in a situation where you do have more bank failures and they they, they shift over to bigger banks and treasuries. And and he would say, well, some people might move to Bitcoin and that will drive the hyperinflation. It is deflationary. Like there will be less credit in the economy. There will be f- uh, fewer loans. So there won't be as much money sloshing around. So by definition, like that, 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 but, but you'll have a lot of de- collateral damage with that. But like to, to claim that like as a result of that process, that is going to cause hyperinflation, that, that, that's not economically based. His version is, while that's happening, people will opt out of the dollar system and move into Bitcoin. That will cause the the hyper Bitcoinization and, and and shift against the dollar. But that's that's the 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 detail that pin them down on is like, okay, is that actually going to happen? Like, how many people, how much capital is actually going to be convinced to go do that? Yeah, I don't like to contradict Balaji on anything, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm fine. I'm fine on that one. I here. fully agree. Uh, credit destruction is highly deflationary. And in particular sectors will be devastated if regional banks stop lending real estate in particular, small business lending. It'll be the same level of destruction that we saw with actually with the COVID basically like no, a, a, a total dearth of access to bank credit is insanely destructive for the economy, puts a massive drag on it. And, and it's something that, you know, people sit in Silicon Valley who have, been walloped last year when we went risk off alongside crypto. They don't live in a debt oriented environment most of the time, right? It's like it's like venture funding and things like that. And so this is actually much more Main Street America gets gets wiped out when you when you pull back on, on the, the credit side of things. And then there's this whole brewing like commercial real estate issue that the second order effect of COVID of more people being remote and people needing less office space is these these leases are going to you know finally come up. And okay, now you have higher rates. It's like people default on the the commercial real estate building in San Francisco. Now the bank owns this building 
and they don't want to own the building. They want to sell the building. And it's like, well, who's going to buy it? Well, there's no like, so, so now you're, you're going to have these cascading things that I think are going to start to hit outside of just like raise interest rates, risk assets go down and people who are making a lot of money in 2021 because the public markets were up felt pain last year. But the real pain for the rest of the economy is going to start to come when, when you actually have the, the credit issue. And it's like people can't get cars. Like it's just like think just all the things in the economy that that so many things break. I and this if you watch the uh, the Fed press conference yesterday or Wednesday, this is the thing that they're currently grappling with: the cost of insuring all those uninsured bank deposits. Which if they don't do that, people will just continue to leave for Treasuries or for the largest banks. There's no reason to stay at those medium sized and smaller banks. The cost of doing that versus the real GDP cost of allowing for this credit destruction to occur. And actually, if you look at the metrics of bank lending, it's already started to hit a wall. And they can't insure all deposits. There's not enough money to do that. It's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. But they also can't allow for the economy to hit a wall like this. What I think is actually going to happen is credit will start to be provided by the government directly. So like in COVID, where you had the CARES Act, where everyone was out of business because of government mandate, and then they just paid people to sit on their couch or they gave stipends to businesses to kind of stay in business. Same thing, like the role of commercial banks, that will be supplemented or replaced by the government. So interest rates will fall to a certain extent, but the, the political cost of allowing inflation to skyrocket here is inordinate. So I think they'll just try and ease this issue of credit destruction by themselves getting into the credit allocation game, which obviously isn't an optimal outcome because we're trusting a single entity to then determine how credit is disseminated in the economy. If, if I was in charge, like, you know, king for a day, um, so it didn't have to deal with Congress or whatever, and you could just like make decisions to try to fix this. So I think Ukraine, you you have to you have to get to some resolution because you have to get Russian energy supplies back into the world and like, you know, all, all the other secondary things there. And so just like from a pure, like, how do you actually fix this? Put put the morality and, and kind of like your judgment of Russia, Ukraine situation aside, get to a piece and, and get that stuff back in into the global economy. So you have, a, you know, deflationary pressure on energy prices. The, the second thing from a longer term standpoint is like the U.S. needs to take energy security which we have basically, but like we should just be over investing in it and we shouldn't be demonizing fossil fuels because they're naturally going to phase out anyways as the solar cost curve stuff gets better. But like actually getting to a place where we have so much abundant energy, the, the overall costs of everything come, come down because energy is cheap. And then I think that the last one is like post COVID, we, we, we haven't let people come into the country. Like not even just uh, talk about like, you know, illegal immigrants. Like legal immigration in the United States is way down since 2020. And, and that's not just a Trump thing. That's also under Biden. And so it's like figuring out how do you like actually get this what structurally unemployed 800,000 job gap. And it's like if you go to any restaurant or wherever and you talk to the owner, it's like I, I can barely have people. That's all inflationary. And so trying to drive kind of like the, the inflationary effects of the labor gap plus energy I think it's crazy to me that that's not a bigger, bigger priority. And, and maybe this is a, the, the 2024 surprise is that we get a piece in Ukraine, uh, you know, call it the two-year anniversary, and then you actually start to see energy supplies go down so that the, the economy starts picking back up at 24 for the re-election. That would be the, the cynical take. But Honestly, in this kind of context, you don't want to be king for a day at all because there's just no good options. They're all insanely unappetizing. But what's the least worst? Is it is it just let inflation go and cut cut rates to save the? If it were up to me, I would actually do that. Yeah, I think inflation would be less costly to society than keeping rates high and letting this play out. Especially given the tight labor market, like in the sense that you probably could get a job, or if like you needed to, you could get a second job. And I also think that the one thing we're on the the precipice of, not to sound too futuristicy. Is I do think that AGI, uh, AGI is not the right term. The AI boom is going to be massively deflationary. It's just going to take some time, right? So it's like that's three years, five years, but like you, you're just going to be able to offer goods and services 
with fewer people at a company. So therefore you can choose to drop your prices while still making the same amount of money. So I, I do think that should be a big thing. And then if you believe that that's upstream of improvements in robotics, right? So if like what we're seeing with the LLM stuff now, three years or five years from now is really starting to play out in like actually robotic automation, like some of the stuff that Tesla's doing with that, you know, gimmicky robot. But like, if, if you do actually get improvements there, then then you actually, just like always, technology comes to the, the rescue and it actually like outpaces the inflationary pressures of, of, of the moment. Yeah, the question is where growth comes from. And historically, it's obviously one of two things, population growth or productivity growth. Our demographics right now are terrible. So like when we got out of the inflationary high debt eras of the 40s or the 70s, the demographics were favorable. Right now, they're certainly not. So it has to come from productivity, which I actually agree, Dan. I think this is my dark horse here for how we could have like a softish landing over the next 10 years, even though we're horrendously indebted and we should expect an inflationary reset is AI is that productivity boon that powers that incremental 2 or 3% of GDP growth that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And so th- I think there is a path where we can kind of grow our way out of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, like arguably... It- it could be a second industrial revolution, like that big of a productivity boost. But but the the things that start to get interesting are like, okay, so let's say you have an LLM, you have an LLM equivalent GPT that can ace the um, the MCAT, right? So it's just like perfect score on on the medical exams. Uh, you blind you know test of like a doctor giving the advice versus the LLM, and the LLM is even more accurate than the smartest group of doctors, and, and you just have this all data. They're never going to allow it. They're, they're just, they're going to keep it regulated because the, the special interests of, of the American Medical Association will be like, whoa, 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 we, we need a human making those decisions, even if you had all the data in support. And so I think that those are going to be some of the fights. And, and obviously, there are plenty of other areas where you can have that deflationary thing. But we love talking about the chart on, on this podcast of, you know, Bobble's cost disease, where you have all the things that have gotten cheaper over the last 30, 40 years, and the things that have gotten more expensive. And it's like, healthcare, education, housing. And so the, the question I always have is like, okay, well, how is AI actually going to reduce costs in these areas that effectively it's, it's because of the regulatory environment that they, they continue to increase in cost? Yeah, the Mark Andreessen had an excellent piece on that, right? Where he said uh, certain corners of the economy can't be affected by AI because they're like guilds or like just too regulated. So we collectively as society need to decide like, if the LLM is more accurate than the doctor, are we okay having a system where I, I as an adult can choose to use the LLM? And here's the thing, though. I think what's going to happen, because it's on the internet, is people are just not going to go to the doctor. They're just going to go to you know webmd.com. Even if it's not legal in the US, they can, they can just pay pay Bitcoin, pay in a credit card overseas or whatever, and then basically get, get the, the stuff. And they're going to get a better product. So yeah, like, uh, you know, collect your biomarker data, your blood test data, feed it into a model. Who cares if it's a black box model and you don't know how the inferences were made? If it gives a better output, why not? R- wrapping up here, is your base case, uh, you talked about what you would do if you were a uh, king for day. Is your base case that, that basically Lynn Alden was right? No, he, he, he specifically said he didn't want to be king for day. I was right, that's a poison chalice. You don't want that. <laughs> yes. Well, is Lynn Alden right? Basically, is your base case that we'll have just kind of persistent inflation for the next five to 10 years until we have some sort of productivity boom? I think the macro trends that people generally point to, like deglobalization and our failed trends here in energy investment, uh, are highly inflationary. Also, the green, uh, like green revolution type thing. Uh, in the very short term, what's happening is incredibly deflationary. So we could see CPI back at 2% actually within 12 months, I think. Uh, but yeah, my view is that we're in a period similar to the 70s now, basically, in terms of like inflation is high and variable and stays that way for a long time. That's really the only way to reduce the debt load. You could have insane levels of growth. You could have austerity. No one's going to go for austerity. So we're, I think we're just getting higher inflation. Uh, someone in our chat the other day said that the debt can just roll over forever. Like we just never have to pay it. You remember that argument? You still have to pay the interest, which is a trillion dollars right now. <laughs> yeah, you, you you pay the interest. But to uh, Nick's point is if you can grow faster than the amount of debt that you're taking on, and that's been the U.S.'s whole 
gimmick, right? Like it's it's just like, okay, if GDP growth grows at 3% a year or 3.5% a year, something crazy because of technology gains, the, the debt doesn't matter because you're, you're, you're growing the top line of the business. Think of it as like a business, right? Like the, the GDP growth is the top line. And so I think we're debt bugs or whatever you want to call them, like debt doomers, they, they think of the government as a household, right? The difference between the government and the household is the government can issue currency and move the levers around. You can't do that. They have guns. So they actually have like ability to, they can increase taxes, right? Like they have other levers there. And, and the reality is, is if the economy grows, then it doesn't, doesn't actually matter. It's, it's when the economy doesn't grow and you continue to increase the expenditures, that's, that's where you start to blow up. So, I don't know. Bet on, bet on SpaceX, bet on Tesla. But maybe it's an optimistic note to, to end on. And Nick, I want to be mindful of your time. Thanks so much for coming on the Moment of Zen podcast. This is great. Thank you. Moment of Zen is brought to you by Riverside, the platform Dan, Antonio, and I use to record all of our podcast episodes with remote guests. Riverside captures exceptional audio and video quality, makes it incredibly easy for us to record conversations with multiple guests and then edit and publish within minutes. If you're hosting a podcast or often getting interviewed, use our code ZEN to get a 20% discount at Riverside FM. The link is in our description box. SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months, and it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it, and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame.